Dear colleagues and friends, uh, welcome to this webinar on CCUS in Australia. My name is Juho Lipponen, uh, coordinator of the Clean Energy Ministerial CCUS initiative. Uh, the COP26 meeting is in full swing in Glasgow and very obviously provides a critical backdrop for the discussions uh, today, which will be about carbon, carbon capture, CO2 utilization, and one of the leading countries in this field, Australia. Uh, Australia has accelerated its CCUS policy recently, and today you will be hearing about the latest developments from government, but not only government, but also research and industry representatives. Uh, we have an excellent uh, speaker lineup uh, uh, today. Uh, we hope that you enjoy the insights during the next 60 minutes. Joining me today are uh, Dan Quinn, General Manager at the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources uh, of Australian Government. Uh, Alison Hortel, uh, Research Group Leader at Australia's National uh, Science Agency, CSIRO. And Paul Clark, General Manager at the Oil Major Chevron. Uh, our agenda is as follows. After my introduction, we will hear from our three speakers. And after their insights, we will use the last 20 minutes for discussion and Q&A. Now, please post your questions in the Q&A function uh, uh, of, the, of the webinar. You may also use the chat function to chat, but please don't put your questions in there because we may not be able to perhaps monitor it that well. And you will have access to the slide deck after the event with more detail on, uh, on speakers and their bios and so forth. Now, before handing over to, to, to Dan, uh, just a few words on uh, my organization. The Clean Energy Ministerial is a global process to accelerate the deployment of clean energy. The 29 green countries on the map are SEM members. 90% of clean energy investment happens within these countries, but so do also three quarters of global CO2 emissions. So this is a very relevant global partnership. Check the website that is at the bottom of the slide for more information and also, for example, for events that the SEM is organizing at COP. Now, your host today is the SEM or Clean Energy Ministerial CCUS initiative, one of many initiatives under, the, under this process. Um, uh, we have 13 member countries with the joint objective to accelerate CCUS together. And Australia joined our initiative in September. We are, of course, very, very happy to welcome such a resourceful new member amongst our ranks. So welcome, Australia. Um, the way we work to accelerate CCUS is via these four main areas of activity. Without going through all these, we are essentially a platform that helps to bring governments, industry, and the finance sector together to discuss and to form coalitions to drive CCUS opportunities forward. Now, with that, let's move to the program of the day and to our first speaker, uh, who is uh, Dan, Dan Quinn. So Dan, please, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Yuho. And um, look, thanks everyone for giving me some of your time. Uh, my name is Dan Quinn. I'm the general manager of the resources strategy branch in uh, the Australian government. And our branch is the lead on carbon capture use and storage policy in Australia. Um, more broadly than just carbon capture use and storage, Australia is focused on taking a technology, not taxes approach to reducing emissions. Uh, you might have seen that our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, and our Minister for Industry, Energy and Emissions Reduction, Angus Taylor, announced last week Australia's long-term emission reduction plan, which is our whole of economy plan to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. It's focused on driving down technology costs and accelerating deployment at scale. The plan builds on the government's technology investment roadmap and emissions, techno uh, sorry, emissions technology statement. Um, it sets priority stretch goals that can deliver 40% of the emissions reduction that we require to reach net zero. Uh, the technology investment roadmap sets, um, sets these goals across a range of different technologies. And one of these technologies is carbon capture and storage, which has an associated stretch goal of under $20 for compression, transport and storage of one tonne of CO2. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please, Yuho. Um, so 
as you can see from this first slide, we have a range of measures in Australia that uh, we're working on to uh, progress uh, and accelerate the deployment of carbon capture use and storage. Uh, we have um, just started working on developing a national abatement strategy, and we'll be doing this over the next year uh, that will help guide the deployment of carbon capture use and storage across Australia. We are also investing $300 million in carbon capture use and storage over 10 years um, in, through two programs, a $250 million hubs and technologies program and a $50 million CCUS development fund. Uh, the, the, the hubs and technologies program is currently open for applications. It's open for another six days. Um, and that program is seeking to leverage significant co-investment from the private sector uh, from our state and territory governments, and also from international counterparts. The program will be comprised of two different streams. We will have a $150 million technology stream, which will support research, development, and commercialization of CCUS technologies, and the identification of viable CO2 storage sites in Australia. And there will be a $100 million hub stream, which will support the design and construction of shared CCUS infrastructure uh, between multiple co-located emitters uh, near viable CO2 storage sites. So that's the hubs and technologies program. Um, we've also just completed um, our grant allocations under the CCUS uh, Development Fund, um, and we allocated uh, funding to six companies, and I'll talk a little bit more about those later. Um, hydrogen hubs will also be an integral part of the shared CCUS infrastructure approach. And the Australian government recently announced the $464 million activating a regional hydrogen industry, clean hydrogen industrial hubs program, which aims to accelerate the development of an Australian clean hydrogen industry and will in turn help add value to industrial energy hubs and help to de-risk the investments. We also have the Emissions Reduction Fund, and under this, businesses can apply, uh, can claim Australian carbon credit units or ACUs for every tonne of emissions that uh, is reduced through CCS technologies. And uh, just this week, we've had an announcement of the first uh, project that's going to be registered under the CCS method for that, with Santos um, announcing that their Moomba uh, project will um, be going ahead uh, in 2024. Um, and I think that will initially be storing around 1.7 million tonnes of CO2 uh, per annum, uh, but does have the potential to go as far as 20 million tonnes um, of CO2 per annum. Um, so, uh, the, um, the, and, and interestingly, on that Santos project, um, they're predicting that their costs of actually storing the CO2 might be as low as around $24 a tonne. Um, currently, the ACUs, uh, when they're traded back to the government, are worth around $17, $18 a tonne, but that price is going up. Um, so it may be that this is essentially a cost-neutral CCS operation for Santos. Um, the government has also broadened the mandate of our Renewable Energy Agency, which um, has invested around $2 billion in uh, renewable energy uh, to date. Um, and its uh, broader mandate now means that it can invest in carbon capture and storage um, technologies. And there are a number of those that are actively under consideration. So that we hope will help to free up one of the big constraints that works against us in this space, which is obviously access to adequate capital. Um, so in ARENA's plan now for this year, they're going to be going out and consulting with our industry, with our researchers and with um, various government agencies exactly around um, how they can maximise those investments. <coughs> And look, while it's not listed on this um, on this slide, I also want to recognise uh, SIRO's excellent CO2 utilisation roadmap, which identifies over 50 possible carbon capture uses that may have commercial value. And I know Alison Hortel, who's going to be speaking after me, um, will provide you with a lot more detail on that. So if we could go to the next slide, please, Yuho. Um, so on this slide, you can see the six companies that were successful under our CCUS Development Fund. Uh, so Mineral Carbonation International, 
is an Australian technology company that has received $14.6 million to be used towards the construction of a mobile demonstration plant that captures and uses carbon dioxide to produce manufacturing and construction materials such as concrete, plasterboard and fire retardant materials. Uh, we have the Brisbane-based Energy Developments PTY Limited, um, who's received $9 million from the fund to help capture and use CO2 that's emitted from biomethane production at various landfill sites across Australia and then using that CO2 for injection into cement. Um, a, a major building materials manufacturing giant in Australia, Boral, has received $2.4 million for their CCUS mineral carbonation project, which will capture CO2 from their cement plant and store it permanently in recycled concrete, masonry and steel slag aggregates. And Santos was one of the companies that received a grant under the project as well um, for their Moomba project, um, which, as I mentioned before, is expected to store 1.7 million tonnes of CO2 per annum. Uh, we also have a, the Australian coal producer Glencore um, has a uh, the project known as the Carbon Transport and Storage Company project or the CTSCO project. They've received up to five million dollars to demonstrate the viability of carbon capture and storage from a coal-fired power plant in Queensland. And then finally, um, last but not least, Australian Carbon Management Company. Uh, Corporate Carbon Advisory has received $4 million towards Australia's first demonstration of a direct air capture and storage project, which will geologically sequester CO2 into an inject, uh, existing injection well in South Australia. Next slide, please. So um, look, on this slide, I'm not going to read it all out, but we have um, a bit of a rundown of other um, research work that's being undertaken by the CSIRO, um, by Geoscience Australia, um, by uh, the Australian National Low Emission Coal Research and Development, um, and also by the uh, CO2 um, Cooperative Research Centre here in Australia. So um, you can read through those a little bit later. Um, might go to the next slide, Yuha. Uh, so look, despite all of the activity that we've had in Australia, we still face all the same challenges and barriers that uh, I imagine um, all of our colleagues in governments around the world are facing at the moment who are trying to accelerate the deployment of these technologies. Um, Obviously, the primary one is the cost and making it more economic for us to deploy these technologies. Uh, we're taking a two-pronged approach towards that in Australia of trying to work on technologies that are going to bring those costs down in terms of the, the capture and the storage, um, but also looking at revenue streams that we can generate through carbon utilisation to try and lead to a lower sunk cost. But obviously, um, you know, there, there is also a need for governments to provide additional incentives, um, and that is why um, it's a really big step forward for carbon capture and storage in Australia that we can now um, assign carbon credit units to carbon capture and storage projects. Uh, the second hurdle is regulatory. Um, because a lot of these projects are in new, new areas um, that reg with regulators who may not have dealt with them previously, uh, the, the risks are obviously in both directions. You know, in one, on one level, we under-regulate and we have um, an incident that happens that affects the social licence of the industry globally. Um, on the other hand, uh, if we over-regulate, then we don't deploy the technology and we don't get the carbon emission reductions that it can offer us. Uh, so uh, working through exactly where that best practice line is, um, is very important for us. And I think that that's where forums like this one that we're in today are really useful. Um, I think, you know, uh, the, the standards um, side of things is a big area that will come into play as these, these sort of technologies become more commercially viable. And that is about really being able to certify that people are doing what they say they are doing. And, and so consumers are willing to pay premiums for various products that may come out of these processes, um, such as low or negative emission, LNG, steel, um, and so forth. Um, the community acceptance angle is um, a big one that we struggle with at times. We, um, 
we hear that it's a failed technology and that it's just there for the oil and gas giants. Um, I think that we need to start to shift the dialogue more towards um, this is the only technology that can allow us to go net negative. Um, so we will be working on trying to um, highlight the benefits of this, these technologies for broader applications. Um, and then obviously there are the technical problems um, and, you know, uh, we'll be hearing from Chevron a little bit later today. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, um, when you go on these major projects and especially when they're first of a kind, there are a lot of learnings um, that we all need to share as much as possible so that we don't keep recreating the wheel. Okay, um, I think I have one more slide, Yuha. So um, Australia is actively seeking to strengthen its relationships with other countries um, to help to accelerate the deployment of CCUS. Um, we're committed to, global, to a global effort of reducing emissions, and we're looking to share our expertise, skills and technologies um, to help the deployment of CCUS happen more quickly. Uh, so um, look, please reach out to me um, separately after these forums. Um, I'd love to talk to you all uh, and I look forward to doing so. Uh, so I think that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, and I believe I am now handing over to Alison Hortel, who um, I think is going to tell us all about CIRO's CO2 utilisation roadmap. So, um, Alison. Thanks, Dan. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Just a very quick slide as to who CSIRO is, in case you're not familiar. We are the National Research National Science Agency. We have a role of technology development and trusted advice. Um, CSIRO's perspective on the energy transition is really that uh, the transition must to net zero must be affordable and competitive. It must be secure and reliable, and it must be clean and sustainable. And there are many pathways to that objective, and part of what the roadmap was trying to do was to understand what those pathways look like specifically in an Australian context and what the, what the role for utilisation or CO2 utilisation technologies might be. Uh, next slide, please. So today is just a very high level view overview of the report. There's a lot of work and detail gone into it, which I won't have time to present to you today, but the report is available for download. Um, but the, the, it's the conflict between how do we reduce emissions while the demand for carbon-based products will continue to grow and we have to enable the opportunities associated with this, with this, this um, new regime and this energy transition. Um, so this is one of the things the Utilisation Roadmap was trying to address. Next slide, please. So we believe Australia is pretty well positioned to capitalise on this opportunity and to become a leader in that emerging area because we have such vast area and such vast resources and this slide really um, is a Venn diagram that sees how the interplay of these technologies work together. And that's one of the key questions that we're trying to understand and kind of unravel in our context is how do these things play into each other? How do they work together? How do you leverage off uh, renewable energy as a cheap and re a reliable energy source? How do you generate a hydrogen industry? And how do you encourage the, de the um, development of utilisation technologies to leverage off those resources and create new industries, new opportunities, new jobs and new benefit, et cetera. And there are a range of different opportunities with different um, benefits, pros and cons, different barriers, different levels of technology readiness. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty exciting time and lots of opportunity, but you know, time is of the essence. Uh, a lot of this is underpinned by the carbon capture and storage element because we know that the, the large volumes of CO2 that we're currently dealing with uh, storage underground is really the underpinning technology to, to re significantly reduce that. But utilisation has a, a role to play in, um, in the economic benefits and associated um, uh, industries um, to leverage off that. So that's a sort of a, a, a spot diagram of where Australia's basically our hard to abate emitters really are located and they're spread around the country, as you can see. Um, we have different, a lot of natural gas processing facilities. We have less ethanol, but, and, but ammonia is it something that's increasingly important. Uh, we have cement because construction is, a, is something that is just going to continue to grow. We don't have a lot of biomass, but that's another biomass technology that's in the background kind of evolving because, again, biomass uh, waste to energy is something that we will have to continue to deal with. So 
Australia has lots of natural resources. We have lots of natural um, storage opportunities in our, in, the, in our subsurface reservoirs, both onshore and offshore. So we can capitalise on those as well. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a bit of a, a snapshot of the challenge associated um, for, for utilisation. And you can see that um, even though abatement costs are not static, and this is really just a snapshot of, of um, um, you know, um, what it, the cost of abatement. And you can see that even with a 50% plus or minus 50% sale price variation on the cost of abatement, and that was part of the roadmap's approach to simplifying and enabling comparison across the different technologies, uh, noting that this is very a very variable market. Um, but you can see from there that mineral carbonation is something that may be viable now. And of course, we're only talking about the actual creation of silicates and um, uh, magnesium carbonates, not the actual refinement into other high value products, just that first step. That looks like it could be, become, become a viable and profitable technology sooner rather than later. The others have a lot more, uh, a bigger step to go to, to become um, competitive with the current fossil based versions of that. But so that's really the, state, the, the, the a statement of the challenge, but it's also an opportunity. Um, so next slide, please. So the outcomes of the, the four key objectives really of the roadmap were to really re realize this opportunity where Australia needs to be strategic, well thought and well informed approach to how we scale this, this technology up and the role it plays in our, in our development in the future. And these are the four key points and I'll talk through each one of these very briefly on the next slides, but it's, a, it's about diversification and collaboration across multiple opportunities. Um, it's a portfolio solution. There is not one size that fits all. It's not simply a matter of picking a winner. It's a matter of picking what is the best solution for your particular point, your particular industry, your particular um, resource environment. And to create incentives and to minimise the barriers to entry to, to new entrants into the market. Um, and, of course, to support and devise the investment and in planned infrastructure. How do you get the best leverage out of your, how do you get the best bang for your buck, if you like, if you're going to invest in infrastructure, how do you make sure that infrastructure has most efficient uses, has a number of different potential common users, you know, these kind of uh, thinking um, processes. Um, so the roadmap is really just the first step of trying to think through these kind of issues, like raising the raising the flag, understanding what the pros and cons are, what the levers are that we can pull and how they might be pulled in, in Australia's context. Next slide, please. The first one, of course, is to diversify and engage across the, um, across the, the value chain. Um, avoiding duplication, attracting investment, improving outcomes. So we need to be... Less, less competitive and more collaborative for these large infrastructure. There's large infrastructure requirements for CCS and for hydrogen um, and for solar panels as well. So we need to collaborate and work together to get the best benefit out of these. Um, Australia needs to really clearly communicate its um, position and what it believes our role is and what our pathway forward is and how to integrate. And this is a key one. How do you integrate what you've already have in terms of existing infrastructure, existing proposals, your existing activities, um, and bring in new, new technologies as hydrogen and um, um, solar energy um, and build a kind of a circular economy as best we can and utilising waste, waste products such as heat. How do we utilise heat in these processes? Um, next slide, please. So again, it's the support, it's this um, portfolio approach. And I think that's really important. Um, it's it's a you, the role of utilization, um, even as a scaled up opportunity, it's 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 not necessarily going to have an impact on climate change, but it is an important part of our decarbonisation solutions. So as part of the roadmaps development, um, we looked at developing a few scenarios and we took really conservative assumptions to sort of you know, try to sort of find some boundaries of where to start, really just to, to start to start the conversation. So, for example, what it would take to, um, in this context, to what sort of scale it would be required to take 20 to 30 percent of emissions from the hard to abate industries, such as cement and um, uh, those kind of other industries. So, for example, in this particular scenario that we modelled, uh, we would require three methanol factory facilities, 
two electrofuel facilities to help service about eight to 10 of the domestic fuel market, for example. One olefins facility, um, which would take you know, one to 2.5 tonnes of uh, CO2 and up to six mineral carbonation facilities. And this is across the entire country um, to be paired with a range of different mining and steel and cement operations. So if you put all those things together, and this, this is just one scenario, what a scale up might look like just around utilisation and just to tackle around 20 to 30% of our emissions from these hard to obey industries. So that's a challenge, it's, um, but it's all, it's all doable. Um, um, we would, it's dependent on having more CO2, dependent on having cheap renewable energy, dependent on having a high source of hydrogen. So these are all parts of where we need to take this, this technology and these, this work. Uh, next slide, please. So this figure shows that really almost all CCUS applications, as we know, will incur a green premium, an additional cost, uh, an exception, as I said before, which is the mineral carbonation. Uh, so for example, methanol is about $250 per tonne when derived using fossil fuels in Australia. But if you were using CCU technologies, it would cost up to 600, 650 using our best case. So that's about 150% premium for a low carbon products. Now, it's important to note that these premiums are, are, are fluid, very fluid and reflect just the point in time and, and really the scale of the challenge. But over the long term, these cream, green premiums will be reduced by driving down the cost of the production. Um, for, and for in this case, for example, the cost of hydrogen accounts for about 70% of the production costs. So if we reach our stretch targets of hydrogen for $2 per kilogram, that's gonna reduce the cost really significantly. Um, and for another, at the same time, on the reverse side of that, um, the carbon intensive uh, incumbent could actually go up if there was a carbon price, uh, um, um, carbon credits trading on the international market, or border tariffs, um, all of these kind of other external markets would you know, push it the other way. So it is a challenge because while we move, want to move very rapidly and the demand for these products will grow, at the moment the fossil fuel alternative is, is cheaper. So how do we fill the gap between what is a cheap and readily available product to something that we will still need, but at the moment is too expensive? And it's that transition and that building the infrastructure that enables that transition, which is where the challenge is. Uh, and that's the next slide, finally. Next slide, please. Um, so how do we couple these applications with existing and planned infrastructure to add value and support this scale up? Um, so this is just, again, one example of a particular value chain, for example, methanol. So you have renewable energy or solar or wind power. You have a hydrogen source. You have a CO2 source, which in the future could be direct air capture or from existing industrial point sources, such as fertilizers or um, uh, LNG. Um, some of that CO2 goes to storage. Some of it goes into a methanol um, facility. The H2 comes into there as well. You produce methanol, which, which you can use to meet your local demand and upgrade that methanol through value adding to a whole bunch of other high value products which again, we didn't consider those kind of, the, we didn't take these value chains all the way through to the end because it's usually variable. Or act to export facilities, either for local demand, but also for export as well. So there's your export facility as well, which could be multi-use. Um, so that's next slide, really. So that's really, because I only had 10 minutes, that's a very high level view of the report and the, the highlights really from that report. And of course, as usual, I'm not, I'm here presenting, but I'm actually representing a number of people who worked really hard on this document. And um, I think we did a, really, did a good job. The report is available for download if you're more interested to talk, to, to read more, read more detail about how the models were run, how the scenarios were chosen, what we think are the best options for Australia. Um, you're more than welcome to download the document or and contact uh, the project team to discuss in more detail. Uh, next slide, please. We'd also like to thank the sponsors because part of the um, part of the key parts of developing the roadmap is to engage with a number of industries. So it's government, but there's oil and gas motors, but there's also um, fertilizer producers, uh, mineral carbonation people to get that really broad perspective, uh, so that we are, have that kind of. Um, that view of the whole range of the of the spectrum across the value chain. So that's been really important, and we do appreciate the the uh, feedback and the conversations we've had with all of our different sponsors. Um, 
So next slide, please, is really the last one. Um, so just let's say thank you again. Thank you for listening. I hope that was helpful and interesting. And of course, we're always ready to discuss and ask, answer any questions you may have. So feel free to contact any of us. And with that, I will hand over to Paul. Great. Th thanks, Alison. Okay, so um, uh, great to have the opportunity to share with you all uh, what is the world's largest uh, CCS project to date uh, on Barrow Island here uh, offshore Western Australia. I'm uh, speaking from Perth and representing uh, Chevron and our Gorgon joint venture partners. If we could go to the next slide. So I'll just take you through uh, sort of the backdrop of, of where our CO2 is coming from. Uh, so we have two giant fields, Jance and Gorgon. Uh, we have over 20 TCF recoverable uh, from those two fields. And collectively, they produce over a TCF a year. So uh, high volume, high rate wells. Um, and from the Gorgon field, uh, unlike Jance, which has very little CO2, ne negligible in fact, uh, Gorgon has around 15 to 16% CO2. So as we bring that uh, Gorgon volume uh, into Barrow Island, uh, where our LNG facility is, uh, we're having to remove that CO2 uh, prior to the liquefaction process. Uh, CO2, of course, uh, would freeze at the temperatures uh, of LNG, and it's a significant volume. So although 15 to 16% um, uh, CO2 in, in that methane mix, uh, it's by weight around 30%. Uh, so uh, the Gorgon and Jantz fields collectively uh, produced a little over 15 million tonnes per annum uh, of LNG, uh, but uh, close to uh, 4 million tonnes of reservoir CO2. So what we're dealing with here in our CCS project uh, is the removal, compression and storage of reservoir CO2. We can go to the next slide. So here it is in cross section. So we have the, the Jantz field in, in much deeper water, uh, the Gorgon field up on the scarp and two separate flow lines that come into the three LNG trains on Barrow Island. So those three LNG trains have separate acid gas removal units. Uh, that's where CO2 is separated from methane, uh, then compressed and injected into the Dupuy formation that you can see there in green. Uh, we also have a domestic gas pipeline. So uh, one of the obligations we have as part of our development plans um, is to supply domestic gas into the domestic gas pipeline uh, on mainland Western Australia. Uh, but otherwise, uh, LNG and condensate uh, are shipped to Asian markets. And just to point out, uh, there's our joint venture partner uh, distribution on the bottom right hand side. Okay, so here it is in plan view. Perhaps if we start on the right-hand side, just to draw your attention to the map. Uh, so the, the, red, uh, the red line coming in is a subterranean uh, trunk lines. There's two of them. Again, one from Jantz, one from uh, the Gorgon field. Uh, so that those trunk lines come down uh, into the plant uh, that you can see uh, down there. And then the green line with green squares, that's the CO2 injection sites. So after we've removed CO2, uh, we inject into uh, those three sites that have multiple wells. And then to the left or to the west, uh, there are pressure management sites. So we have uh, two sites there where we're cycling water out of the same reservoir that we're injecting into, uh, bringing that to surface and then re-injecting that into the overlying aquifer, which is the Barra Group aquifer. Uh, if we can, so, and looking at the plant itself, uh, you can see there the three orange squares uh, that's where we remove the CO2, uh, compress it, and then uh, each of those agri units, by the way, uh, produces about 70 to 80 million standard cubic feet a day of CO2. So it is a high volume of CO2, and with that 4 million tonne per annum um, capacity, uh, that, that's what makes it uh, the largest of its kind in the world today. And next slide. This is just a, a quick view of actually one of the CO2 injection sites on Barrow Island. Uh, so, so this site has uh, three injection wells and a monitoring well. Uh, so as we're injecting uh, CO2, two of the locations do have monitoring wells just so that we can monitor uh, the, the progress of the plume. Uh, we've actually just shot a 4D seismic survey that will give us our 
uh, first imaging look uh, at the actual CO2 plumes themselves. That's part of our uh, integrated sort of monitoring program here. And we also have microseismic, uh, an array uh, that sits over the top of uh, all of the uh, injection locations and also at the pressure management locations, just monitoring microseismic. And to the next slide. Here's a, a bit of a three dimensional cartoon of what's going on. So uh, you can see that the three red squares on Barrow Island, that they're the CO2 injection locations. So from those, those uh, three locations, you can see multiple uh, deviated wells that we're injecting CO2 into. So uh, that CO2 goes into the Dupuy formation. Uh, the Dupuy formation, and actually my association with this project, uh, when I was a, an early geologist out of university 20 years ago, uh, that's where this started. So uh, we were talking about the identification of the Dupuy as a location for CO2 storage. We had no depleted large fields uh, that we could inject um, significant volumes into. Uh, and the Dupuy formation had very different salinity to the overlying formations, um, hence proving its isolation in geologic time. Uh, so that's really why the Dupuy formation was selected. But although extensive, it's still somewhat of a confined aquifer. And because of that, if we can go to the next slide, whilst we're injecting CO2 uh, into the red as per the red arrows, you can see in blue uh, that we're actually removing water from the same aquifer, the Dupuy formation, uh, bringing that to surface and then re-injecting that into the Barra group. Now, one of the, I guess, one of the issues that we've had operationally uh, is in fact completely unrelated to uh, CO2 removal, compression and injection. Uh, it's simply been on the uh, pressure management side. So um, on the plumbing side of, of the equation here, as we've taken water out of the Dupuy, uh, it's actually brought with it uh, some solids and fine, so sand and, and fine silt. Uh, so we've had to install uh, filtration at the surface before injecting uh, that water into the Barra group. Uh, so that, that's caused some operational delays. But uh, one of the issues we've had here is that uh, one of the regulatory requirements is over the first five years uh, of, of operation of the LNG plant, uh, the expectation was that we were to uh, inject 80% of the reservoir CO2, and we fell short of that. Uh, the reason being is that uh, the CO2 system didn't come online until about two and a half years after we started LNG production. So uh, we, uh, we, we had no chance of meeting the 80% uh, target, but Certainly that uh, is not related to the actual operation of CO2 injection. Really the only operation uh, limitation we've had is just on that uh, filtration of, of the fines that are coming out of the Dupuy before we inject it into the Barra group. So we don't clog up uh, that injection well. And if we can go to the next slide. So Chevron, uh, as well as our, our other industry partners and others uh, operating in Australia, uh, for example, Santos, uh, we heard today about um, the Moomba project going forward. Uh, we've done extensive studies uh, of just uh, Australian aquifers, uh, those that are suitable for storage. Um, Chevron uh, globally has announced uh, strong aspirations uh, to increase carbon storage through CCUS and CCS. Uh, so at the moment, Chevron is around 5 million tonnes per annum. Uh, by 2030, our target is 20, sorry, is 25 million tonnes per annum. Uh, and by 2035, uh, doubling that again. So uh, Chevron continues uh, to clarify its aspirations uh, towards uh, net zero by 2050. And each of the business units across the enterprise are building roadmaps uh, to achieve that. So with that, I think that's the final slide, you know. That indeed was the final slide. Thank you, Paul and, and uh, Dan and Alison as well. It's an amazing panel because we are right uh, on time, which is not often the case in, uh, in, in any event in the world. But uh, so thank you very much for, uh, for these, these insights. And uh, we can stop the... Uh, screen share there for a moment and go to uh, uh, go to a discussion 
and Q&A uh, session for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, so everybody um, listening in, you can send questions through the Q&A function and we will, uh, we will pick, pick up some of the questions from, uh, from there. And you can use chat, but perhaps use the chat to chat because we may not be able to monitor that, that side of, uh, of things that well. Um, but so kicking off the, uh, uh, the Q&A, um, COP has now started and it would be perhaps uh, not wise to totally ignore what's happening uh, in, this, in, the, in the wider framework right at this moment. And so COP is in full swing and with tremendous expectations. And if I could ask all the panelists that in your mind, what is the importance of this particular COP for CCUS? And what might you personally like to see come out of this? Maybe we can start with that. Thanks, Yuho. Um, look, obviously, this is a, a, a historic meeting that's going on at the moment and one where the world is really turning its attention to how it's going to reach its net zero ambitions. And um, I think that as we do that, um, CCUS will inevitably become part of that conversation as we talk about the challenge that we face, as we get our head around just how complex it is, um, it quickly becomes uh, uh, an essential part of any, any discussion. Um, so as part of the COP meeting, um, Australia will actually be um, holding a, a roundtable on the 4th of November in the Australian Pavilion. Um, we unfortunately, um, due to COVID restrictions, we are still limited in terms of numbers. So um, it is a um, uh, an invitation only event at the moment, um, unfortunately, but we will be um, having our energy um, and emissions reduction minister there um, and uh, um, some great presentations um, from some of our companies, including Chevron. Um, so, uh, yeah, really looking forward to that and, and just that opportunity to really sort of forge those collaboration links even more strongly in that international community. Dan, just a quick uh, uh, follow up on that. Is your event live streamed? Do you know, or is it behind behind closed doors this time? I, I think we are going to actually look to have that live streamed, um, but uh, we don't have the details yet. But yeah. once I get those, I'll be happy to send them on, on to you. You hope right. perhaps you could distribute them to the group. Sure, great. Uh, Alison, how about you? Um. Yes, look, it's a really interesting question. I've been working in CCS for a long time, longer than I care to think. And what I'm really, what I'm really excited about, what I think is different this time, is that this, this evolution of thinking of the emissions problem as rather than a problem, but as an opportunity. And I'd really like to see more of that and that sort of concrete realization that 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 dealing with our providing meeting our, our ongoing and increasing energy needs with ways that it's you know it's low emissions it's sustainable and it's it's economically viable and it's an opportunity to, de to generate new industries new opportunities new jobs is really exciting i'd like to see more of that i'd also like to see um broadening of the acknowledgement that that this is not an either or situation that we will need all opportunity options on the table and it's not about picking one or two it's everything is going to be required and they will each find their place because it's easier for some countries and some places to decarbonize than others depending on their on their circumstances so i think that's the sort of things i, I would like to see more concrete movement around paul i'll hand to you yeah and, and perhaps um building on your comments allison i think australia has uh, huge potential storage uh, opportunities for for carbon uh, within the region, you know, there are some limitations, but uh, offshore and onshore Australia uh, definitely provides um, sort of significant potential. And as you say, it's really a portfolio solution uh, that, that the globe really needs to pursue. And the scale at which uh, CCS can be impactful, uh, it's really, it's on its own. So hopefully COP26 will uh, just raise the, the appreciation and understanding of that. And I'll, I'll actually have an opportunity at the round table to share a little bit on uh, the Barrow project and maybe debunk uh, you know, some of that, that negative messaging that seems to be out there. 
thanks, uh, thanks everyone for for those um, th those answers. Um, moving to a few uh, individual questions, then. Um, so Dan, you outlined the government's current uh, uh, approach to CCUS, and clearly you're accelerating pace uh, and increasing attention to CCUS uh, again now. Uh, can you go back a little bit behind that? Why? What's the reason for uh, for you uh, accelerating at this point in time? Thanks, Yuho. Uh, look, it's a really good question, and I think you know there's multiple answers to it. Um, I think primarily um, the federal government, uh, as I noted before, has really taken this technology, not taxes, approach. And once you start focusing in on the technologies that you need to get to net zero. Um, the CCUS technologies just become a natural part of the conversation. Uh, on top of that, we already have some really world-leading uh, projects in, in the CCS space. Uh, we're blessed with uh, over 300 geological basins in this country um, and incredible opportunities that we've only really scratched the surface of in terms of storage sites. Um, we have a great research community that, um, you know, is really at that cutting edge on that carbon utilisation side of things and, and looking at ways that we can really make money out of this, um, the, these technologies. So uh, I think it's a lot of things coming together. Um, you know, obviously now we've got the net zero um, target has been announced by the Australian government and, and even things like this COP26 meeting just in terms of really focusing everyone's minds on the challenges that we face. Um, I think all of that is giving us momentum and I really don't see it. I don't see it dropping off. Excellent, thank you. And indeed, uh, I, I think momentum attention on CCUS has uh, possibly not ever been as good as it is now. So uh, we uh, will have a, a good and interesting and positive role to play these days to, to drive this forward. Um, uh, Alison, um, so that, thanks, thanks for your views on the on the utilization side. Um, uh, on one of the slides, which I found very interesting, was your CCU scale up slide, where you were talking about the different types of uh, um, uh, uh, sectors that could um, uh, that could be involved. Um, I think mineral carbonation was also one of the uh, sectors that you thought was particularly interesting because because of the because it could be cost effective already now. But um, in, in your mind, where would what do you think the best or the first CCU projects could could be? Who would be undertaking them? Where might they be in what sectors? Uh, what do you see happening concretely in the field? So I think um, I think it's a matter of utilizing what you already have. So for example, there are a number of industries that already produce a relatively clean and captured source of CO2. So not only the uh, LNG industries, but the fertilizing industry, for example. So you already had some of the cement industries, you have a clean and available source of CO2 readily available. So you can utilize that if you have sufficient power and you can build electrolyzers electrolyze for hydrogen. So use what you already have, infrastructure where you already have it, um, to make that, that benefit. Um, it's a bit, it's an interesting question. The mineral carbonation question is interesting as well because you have, you need a source of CO2, but you also need a source of minerals. So the question is really, do you take the rocks to the CO2 or do you take the CO2 to the rocks? And that is a very site specific and um, resource specific question. So really the, the answer is a, the biggest barrier that we still see, and this again comes back to the hubs concept. Um, you have a large uh, customer or, or uh, a storage entity that stores large volumes of CO2, but you have smaller industries that feed off or utilize that that extra energy that's required to, to do the CCS storage, to um, engage with the emerging hydrogen industry and to utilize the CO2. So it's about that, those kind of hubs and how the how everything sort of play, interplays with each other, I think is the really question. But it's a very specific where you are and what's the best option for the sources, the resources and the opportunities that you have. Um, for example, we're looking at a place here in Western Australia where there's a, a, an industrial hub, which is very well established in industry hub. There are jobs, there are resources, there's manufacturing. Um, so putting something there has de definite advantages because you have manufacturing, you have tools and you have a skilled workforce. We also are talking about the Northern Territory, which is less well developed, but there's opportunity because you can bring all those things in and build it to scale. So it's how those things play off each other. Uh, but the capture is really the, 
the difficult part for smaller players, for smaller emitters, to actually set up a capture and storage project on their own. It's too too much. You need to leverage off a big a big storage um, project, and that's what we're seeing in the other uh, hubs around the world. Thank you. Uh, perhaps over to you, Paul. Then, um, and there's also a few questions in this uh, same style in the in the Q and A. Um, so, what further opportunities does Chevron see for CCUS in Australia? What might be your next next steps here? And and also, what type of government policy and incentives would be most helpful for uh, for you going forward? Yeah, no, no thanks, you uh, yeah, a project like Gorgon, uh, Gorgon, in fact, was Australia's largest uh, single capital investment. Uh, so uh, I guess um, uh, investments that would that would uh, create the abatement uh, required for plants of that magnitude are significant uh, investments. So those the, the uh, incentives for that investment, uh, as Dan mentioned, you know, there's a collaborative intent from government. But uh, when Gorgon, for example, and Wheatstone uh, were sanctioned, there certainly wasn't envisaged uh, this, this path to zero by 2050. Uh, so again, um, retrofit uh, technologies uh, are very expensive uh, and that technology is still building. So I think uh, just continuing with the collaborative um, uh, approach with industry uh, is very important as they're establishing uh, both um, kind of incentives and uh, legislative uh, positions around CCS are going to be important. But there's been a recent release of offshore uh, acreage for greenhouse gas storage. I think that's, a, uh, that's been a very positive move uh, and, and that's been welcomed. But um, certainly Chevron with its aspirations for uh, increasing uh, carbon capture globally, uh, the Asia Pacific region where we have significant uh, investment uh, and also a significant uh, sort of competitive advantage uh, with the infrastructure and uh, fields and resources that we have. Uh, we think that CCS is going to play a critical role for Chevron uh, within the region. Um, I think going forward uh, with the right incentives, you know, there's also an option uh, for not only addressing uh, scope one emissions as we approach, uh, you know, zero by 2050, but also uh, with the right incentives and legislation uh, whether we can move to scope three uh, tolling and the revenue stream that might be associated with that. Uh, that's something else that we might want to consider. Thanks, Paul. Look, looking at the questions uh, that, that are coming in on the Q&A, there's a few interesting ones that could be combined and, and maybe asked to you in the first place. Um, there's one looking at, well, whether Gorgon could ever be a hub for other CO2 sources. Also, there's a question regarding um, shipping and, and has it been looked into as to how much shipping could, could help um, uh, the transport of CO2 in, in Australia? Yeah. Any, any thoughts on these? No, definitely. So, so Chevron's recently established a Chevron New Energies organization. Uh, although based in the US, uh, we're, we're strongly connected to that organization. Uh, we're looking at offshore fields, uh, shipping and its, its technology, its current and emerging technology. Uh, but all of our fields, some, some, many of them are quite immature or yet to be developed. Uh, so I did see one question come into the chat, for example, what's next for Chevron? Uh, those giant gas fields at the rate they're producing, uh, we have uh, 20 fields in 20 years that we need to develop to backfill and keep the plant full. Uh, so through the process of that, uh, that may open up other opportunities for CO2 storage, but uh, a very interlinked uh, opportunity space that, again, it's, it's somewhat in its uh, infancy, but um, certainly plenty of energy and effort uh, going into looking into that. Thank you. Um, some other interesting questions coming in regarding, uh, regarding um, public acceptance, social license to operate and so forth. Um, perhaps, Dan, you can start and others may comment as well. That how is the government working with communities and industry to communicate the relevance of CCUS uh, to achieve the emission reduction targets? Any thoughts on, yeah. on that side? Yeah, thanks, Yuho. Um, look, I think it's a really good question. I did read that one in the Q&A and I noted that, yeah, the, um, the point around the negative press um, 
you know, it always gets a lot of coverage and then um, the good news stories don't necessarily get that so much. So um, I think we have some work to do in understanding what uh, the community concerns potentially are about the technology, but I don't know that they're that widespread at the moment. I think more um, it's a lack of understanding of the utilisation of the technology and the feeling that we're spending all of this money um, to... Uh, do retrofits on old coal-fired power plants and things like that um, that people don't see as being particularly economic is, is a lot of the pushback that we get. So as part of us developing our national abatement strategy, we will be considering things around communication and what we can do to really shift the dial there. Um, but I think a big part of it as well is just the messaging. Um, we know that the human brain responds to fear a lot more than it does to reassurance. Um, so we have to be slightly scary. And I think that that's where really highlighting the net negative aspect of CCUS is, is key because that then shifts people's minds to that scary reality that we may need to go there. Anyone else a brief comment on this question? It, it is a really mm. important question and it is something that we do um, and have addressed multiple times. There have been a couple of successful projects in Australia. So I point to the CO2CRC Otway project in Victoria um, and, uh, and Carbonet in particular. Both of those projects started with a very strong and early community engagement programs and activities. And mm. it's that's been very successful. Um, and a lot of the onshore gas companies do that now. And it really has makes a difference to that allowing people to feel like they've had their voices being heard, that they have their say and that they have buy-in to the actual project activities that are going on. So that's really, um, there's a lot of groundwork to be done with that, um, but it really does pay off. Uh, so it's strong early engagement at ground level, newsletters, town halls, meetings, Ooh. driving around in cars, being visible, that sort of thing. Thank and you. listening, listening to what people have to say. Very important indeed, listening. Uh, we're coming close to the end, uh, so I would like to proceed with one final sort of wrap-up question to each panelist, um, to, to all the panelists. Uh, and if I could get short answers to the following, that what do you think are the key particular strengths that Australia has in terms of being a, in, a, employ, uh, able to deploy CCUS? And what still needs improvement? So perhaps starting, starting from you, Paul, first, and then Alison and Dan. Yeah, I think uh, you know legislative uh, clarity uh, is something that uh, again is emerging and is in a focus for government. Uh, I think that's a, an important step. Uh, but certainly the fact that we have uh, you know giant depleting gas fields uh, offshore uh, that are still at the right depth and pressure that you can uh, inject CO two supercritical CO two uh, to capture you know large volumes of CO two rather than uh, CO two as a gas phase. So. We're just well positioned uh, in a region where there is a high demand for storage. I would Great. second that. It's our it's our natural Australia's natural resources. Not only do we have enormous reserves for CO two storage, which we know is the key emissions uh, climate change trigger, and utilisation is a support mechanism for that. We also have vast solar and wind resources as well, and vast potential for hydrogen as well. So. Our, it's our natural resources where that give us a, a really a real opportunity here, in my view. And that, and I and I would third um, those sentiments, and then also just add that you know I think um, we have very strong support from the Australian government uh, as one of its six technology priorities going forward, um, and so that also uh, will allow us to set up the right environment, hopefully from a regulatory and uh, incentive side of things to make sure that the industry goes ahead. Thank you, Dan. And, and, uh, and Alison and Paul, very much for your, uh, for your inputs. And with that, uh, we will uh, end this webinar and I will just show uh, a final slide to, uh, uh, to our audience. Uh, we will have this webinar recording available on a YouTube channel. If you go on YouTube and, and search for SEMCC US webinars, you will find it. Or you can um, also uh, uh, look it up on the Clean Energy Solutions Center uh, uh, YouTube playlist. 
and we'll send you the link um, also uh, along with these slides um, after the event. Um, and our initiative is uh, also present on various types of social media, uh, and so you're welcome to follow us there. Thank you really very much for joining the event today. Uh, thanks to our speakers for your great insights and have a great day, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.